It was a time not very long ago when it wasn't all that easy to get to Perth and back again by rail. They were the days when Kalgoorlie was a railway outpost and changeover points for trains of different gauges. The line built from Kalgoorlie to Perth had been introduced to service the gold rush. People then were keener to get their gold out of Kalgoorlie or themselves in. How they would have loved something as efficient as the Prospector, with its airline seating and seven hour long service. Until the introduction of the XPT on the East Coast, it was the fastest train in Australia. 3,000 kilometres or so away, near Lithgow in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, is the Zigzag Railway. At first, there may seem no connection. But it was the zigzag which broke the back of the Blue Mountains barrier to the west and rest of Australia. It was the beginning of the railway bridging the Indian and Pacific Oceans. The zigzag and the prospector represent the extremes of the railway line across Australia, from Sydney to Perth and back again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A welcome aboard the prospector is extended to you by Westrail. A brochure setting out details of amenities available has been placed in the pocket on the back of each seat. Light refreshments, liquor, aerated waters, confectionery, cigarettes... For all its attributes, Prospector the Prospector is a train which it seems most Australians know little about. Yet it's been labelled the Bo Derrick of trains in Australia, and for all the right reasons. The Prospector is West Rail's pride and joy they'd be quite content to see a whole generation of little prospectors running around on the rails of Western Australia. It was introduced in 1971, replacing an overnight sleeper train called the Kalgoorlie. If you choose to break your journey at Kalgoorlie, the Prospector is a welcome change from the Trans Australia and the Indian Pacific, which share the line to Perth. It's a line, incidentally, which has a special claim to fame as the only one in Australia to be broken by earthquake. It was at 1 minute to 11 in a place called Meckering on October 14th, 1968, that Australia's biggest and most devastating earthquake hit. I was in Meckering three hours after the earthquake and I can basically the stunned expression on the people. What do you mean stunned expression? It's sort of, well it can't happen to us, but it has. It says, but the atmosphere, was, there wasn't even a bird chirping. Yeah. It, everything was just so deadly quiet. Fortunately, it was minor by international standards, and there were no deaths. But 6.9 on the Richter scale and lasting 40 seconds, it was enough to wipe the old township of Meckering off the map. 
This house was typical of what they looked like after the quake. The fault line split the town emotionally and literally. Here, the occupants simply walked out and left their house as it was on that day. Others stayed and built a new town nearby. The old town was literally dumped as a pile of rubble a kilometre from where it stood. Well, my memory is the day 16 years ago was um, I was on the way home from the beach pulling a caravan and I actually pulled a caravan over the break. I didn't know it was there. You drove over the earthquake yeah, itself? over the quake itself. The six feet of the ground disappeared altogether and put it in a, in a short way. So Melbourne is six feet closer to Perth than it used to be. Measurements tell us that. We can tell it in fence lines where it went through a fence line and um, it's just uh, six feet on the uh, SEC poles, any way you like. They just rooped. And even after the quake, they had instruments on the hill out south and out north, day and night watching one another. I don't know just exactly what they were doing, but something to do with the movement of the earth. Which uh, photo do you think shows the worst, uh, worst damage? Oh, I think they all show a fair bit of damage, but the hotel, perhaps the church, is, uh, is that would be the worst one there. Yeah, that's the worst damage. Felt like a pack of cards. What the instruments out on the hill showed later was that there had been an overthrust to the west of nearly two metres, an uplift of 1.5 metres, a fracture in the earth 35 kilometres long, and that it was felt for 700 kilometres around Meckering. Today's Meckering is just as much a sleepy hollow as its predecessor. Life went on with a few less than the old population of 600. The centre of the old town were these palms. Not far from them was the old railway platform, now slightly more remote from today's track. This approach to Perth ends a rail journey coast to coast. Although it's probably the most isolated capital city in the world, it's also one of the most urban, with 85% of Western Australia's population living here. For all its remoteness, Perth has a knack of attracting international attention. Well before the America's Cup, it won over American astronaut John Glenn, who called it the City of Lights after Perth turned them on for him in 1961. The same consideration isn't given to the Sunday night Indian Pacific as it wends its way through outer Perth at the beginning of a 4,000 kilometre long land bridge from one ocean to another. The extraordinary thing about travelling long distances on Australian trains like the Indian Pacific is that people pace themselves quite differently to shorter journeys in anticipation of the days ahead. The next day brings the train to the famous Nullarbor Straightaway, the longest section of dead straight railway track in the world. This is the last curve we'll see for nearly 500 kilometres. The ride changes noticeably as well. Slowly but surely, the fettlers of outback Western and South Australia 
are replacing the wooden sleepers with concrete. So it's a job, but a monotonous job. Apart from driver changes, the main relief from the monotony up front comes from speed changes, crossing points. The speed limit is then 70 kilometres an hour, so a driver's lock is a series of braking and accelerating. Apart from that, they have to keep an eye out for stock which wanders onto the track. It's an area where they measure acres to the cattle and where it rains once or maybe twice a year. Sydney is still 2,500 kilometres away, but for the passengers, there's the inevitability that they will get there without much trouble, now that it's standard gauge all the way. But it wasn't always so easy. First, there would have been a change from 3 foot 6 inch gauge to standard at Kalgoorlie, then another change at Port Piri back to 3 feet 6. That went to Broken Hill, where the line reverted to standard gauge for the leg into Sydney. That was after 1917. Until then, the only link was a painfully slow overland trip or by sea. Believe it or not, the gauge problem in Australia has been the result of a classic Englishman, Irishman and Scotsman joke. It was a joke which almost turned very sour during the war. Just turn back to 42. Remember? The Englishman was the secretary for colonies who wanted standard gauge. The Irishman was a New South Wales engineer who persuaded that government to adopt the broad Irish gauge. They did, and other states followed suit. Then came the Scotsman to replace him, and back went New South Wales to standard gauge. But South Australia and Victoria were already committed to the Irish gauge, and an impasse was reached. By the time the Second World War ended, it was a huge issue. Look at the map, the Japs did. They saw the broken gauge between the states and laughed, laughed at the hopeless bottlenecks. Laughed at the line shrunk to three feet six in the west, but suddenly stopped and changed the four feet eight and a half to cross the Nullarbor. And then stopped again and spread out wider to five feet three across Victoria. And stopped again and changed back to the stand in New South Wales, four feet eight and a half. Then up to Queensland and change again, back to three feet six, six different gauges. A hundred different engines, a thousand different trucks. Oh, we all change! Oh, Take the children. Grab a light, find the ticket. Get a porter. We're changing trains. We're changing gauge. This is the border. This is the all barrier change. between the states. They won't be in your purse. I always keep them in this pocket. Try looking in your overcoat. They won't be in my overcoat. I always keep them in this pocket. 
Passengers every day, 4,000 tons of freight every week. Men, women, children, babies, papers, parcels, pears, potatoes, plows, tractors, cultivators, turkeys, ducks, onions, apples, fowls, chicken, sheep, and cattle, bulls, cows, iron, steel, timber, coal, and surfaces. Changing carriages, changing trucks, wasting manpower, wasting time. The rails of the clown in this circus ring tumbling, juggling, dropping the freight, but we're not laughing. Look ahead, break down the barriers, throw a single line of steel about Australia, climbing Barclay Tableland, joining Darwin to the south. Push up the horizon, reach out to the lonely men who fight the endless distance of the inland. Long droves like that cost... One of the big hopes for standard gauge around Australia was to give the primary producer some hope of providing an escape route for starving stock in times of drought. In 26, a drought came down on the midwest of Queensland and took four and a half million of them. Perished. Buried in dust and sand. Four and a half million of them. That's a lot of sheep. But it's not only cattle and sheep. What about the grower in the west? If we had a direct rail, western Australia could become the California of Australia. Instead of having to pick our fruit and vegetables half green the way we do now, we could pick them ripe at their best and rail them to the east in refrigerated cars on fast trains. They could cross Australia from Perth to Sydney in about four and a half days. Today, Australian railways carry a yearly load of 525 million passengers and 39 million tonnes of freight. Essential to Australia's defence programme is coordination of railways. It was a glaring fact that had been pointed out to the federal government as early as 1910, when Lord Kitchener came to Australia. His report on military defence proclaimed that railway communication had resulted in lines which appeared to be more favourable to an enemy invading Australia rather than defence of the country. Broken by six different gauges, Australian railways only gave the war a fraction of its great potential. Munitions, machines, soldiers, civilians, Jam the break of gauge points. Hopeless bottlenecks with only one solution. Standardize. Standardize. Standardize we did, well at least to the degree that Brisbane is now connected to Perth. That finally happened in 1970, eight years after Melbourne was linked by standard gauge to Sydney and 40 years after Sydney was linked to Brisbane by the same gauge. Of course, there's nothing magical about standard gauge four feet eight and a half inches or fourteen hundred and thirty five millimeters nothing especially dynamic about the engineering at that width which makes it more suited for railway tracks than any other so where do we stand today victoria laid more broad gauge than anywhere in the world even more than the irish themselves both victoria and south australia are still predominantly broad gauge which means the overland the train between melbourne and adelaide operates on that gauge South Australia also clings to some narrow gauge. Not to be outdone, Queensland and Western Australia are rationalising their economic narrow gauge. In the Sunshine State, they see it as the future, while in Western Australia, they've been aiming for the best of both worlds with dual gauge to run both standard and narrow gauge trains on the same routes. New South Wales remains the home of standard gauge in Australia, which it shares with the main national rail routes. Clear the forests, fell the ironbarks, haul the timber, cut the 12 million wooden sleepers. And standardise. Somewhere in the Nullarbor Plain, the Indian Pacific will have to wait more than once for a goods train to pass. This taste of priorities is explained by the railway saying, anything that breathes isn't worth carrying. So here, the Indian Pacific, for years the flagship of the Australian rail fleet, is subservient to a freight train. 
However, the freight train pays for itself. The Indian Pacific is losing millions of dollars a year. So suggestions have come thick and fast. Give it to private enterprise. Speed it up. Put a casino on it. Slow it down. Make it more of a tourist train. Cut back the bureaucracy. The last suggestion has a familiar ring. Bureaucracy at all levels seems to have had a special interest in the various Australian railways. The inconsistencies in gauges occurred largely because in the mid-1800s, Australia was divided into separate colonies. If in the 1980s you read authorities and states for colonies, you'll find the root cause. Now they change locomotives where once they changed gauges, so the pride of each of the five state rail authorities can be preserved. On the Indian Pacific, for example, the West Rail loco gives way to an Australian national loco which then changes here at Broken Hill with the New South Wales State Rail Authority locomotive. By the third night, the Indian Pacific is roughly three quarters of the way across the continent. Some people on board have decided to make it an early night, totally oblivious to the fact that this is a major stop in a mining town which never sleeps. While on the surface, Broken Hill was a two-gauge town, there's a smaller gauge, largely forgotten and working almost a kilometre underground. These are two vital pieces of equipment in the Zinc Corporation's Southern Cross mine. The huge loader and the 22-ton Gemco battery-operated electric loco. It hauls the lead and zinc-bearing ore through the mine. The track runs for about three kilometres. There's even a loco workshop which has been blasted out of the rock so that one loco can always be in service to keep the mine operating. Where the rail tracks can't go, a fleet of four-wheel drive vehicles carries men and supplies. The actual mining is quite remote from the underground train which carries the ore. It simply comes down a long chute from another level where it's loaded into the rail trucks at predetermined places along the shafts, or drives as they're called by miners. When I first started on the mine, John, uh, you had to have no brains but plenty of this, you know, plenty of muscle, because that's all it was, but, uh, you know, like, there's a lot of skill coming to it now. All, all these blokes here, I tell you what, they can do anything. You know, Apparently like, it's not unusual for Jack, or Rambo as he's known to his mates, to reminisce during the crib break. He's been down the mine for over 40 years, so he has a lot of memories. Rambo's kept a loco driver's ticket, but prefers his current job of keeping the crib room or dining room clean. Once down the mine, it's unusual for any of the workers to go to the surface. 
The underground crews are generally members of contract parties and get paid according to production. So all have an incentive to keep the mine moving for each other's benefit. Therefore, the half-hour-long crib routine is followed almost religiously, with time for a couple of hands of cards, then back to work. The 35-hour week has been a way of life in the mines of Broken Hill for over 60 years. This is the end of the line for the underground loco after a non-stop trip of roughly a kilometre from the last loading point. The ore is emptied into a shaft which drops nearly 100 metres to another level, from which it goes through a crusher for shipment interstate and refinery. If ever a town could be called a one-industry town, this is it. The mines are its lifeblood, and although tourism does flow from them, there'd be nothing without the industry which gouges and blasts 2.5 million tonnes of ore from the ground here annually. Broken Hill quickly earned the nickname of Silver City, and in turn bestowed it upon its own train, the Silver City Comet. Today, when it's seen next to the larger trains like the Indian Pacific and the Alice, which come through the same station, its significance is a little lost. But since 1937 until early 1985, it ran from Broken Hill to Parks, 700 kilometres to the east in New South Wales. Now it goes a step further to Orange, where it connects with the XPT. It's a 12-hour long commuter run with vague parallels to the going nowhere golflander of the Normanton to Croydon line in far north Queensland. It may appear a little weary now as it quietly defers to the larger train and leaves the Broken Hill Station on its three times a week service. But there was a time when it was fated as a new trend in trains. It was launched onto the market with the grand claim to fame of being Australia's first air-conditioned train. This is the same configuration which makes up the Silver City Comet today. Power van, passenger and dining cars, and parcel van. It doesn't set trends anymore, but this lightweight diesel mechanical rail car still has a respectable turn of speed. It was the fastest train in Australia on tracks laid directly onto the ground, when it was often clocked, unofficially, at around 160 kilometres an hour. Oh, uh... No speedo or anything on it. Just run it by here, run it by the tacker up here. She's uh, an old lady, you know. You treat her like an old lady? Oh, I know, she's got to do a job. She does it. You want to go uh, pick up time, she'll do it. Going well for right. In two years, the comet will be 50, but it still manages three return trips a week. What about the noise? Does that put you off a bit? Yeah, well, when you get home, you're finding out. You're still singing out like I am down to your wife. <laughs> One of the things you notice on the rails around Australia is the number of small trains which seem to have been forgotten. 
The Silver City Comet falls into that category, even though it runs on the main line across Australia. So what sort of people travel on the Comet? Well, there's no doubt it's a special experience for tourists and locals alike. In the way of many country people who claim their local service, Patricia Stanmore from Outback Ivanhoe regards it as a necessity. And none of my family or the people in Ivanhoe actually would like to lose the train because it's the main way of getting out of Ivanhoe and also for the children when they went to school at Orange for 14 years they went there and they could get on the Comet and go backwards and forwards without supervision. The Rogers family, holidaying here from England, had heard so many stories about the Comet, they couldn't resist the chance to try it themselves. The name uh, Silver City Comet was mentioned, and I thought it sounded like a rather spiffy sort of name for a country train. On our way out to Broken Hill, it was pointed out to us by a 16-stone local who's intimated that, huh, that's the, that's the pride of the, that's the pride of the West there, that's the uh, Silver City Comet. And actually, it looked a rather lovely old uh, train, very nicely appointed. It gave us a chance to see something of uh, Australian railway honour. While for Daphne Hedgecock, a tourist from Sydney, the reason was simple. I chose the Comet because it's daylight and you have the scenery, which you don't have at night. How would you compare with, say, something like the XPT? Oh, uh, well, a T-Mobile board or a Rolls Royce. That's different, huh? Yeah. But I suppose she would have been something of the XPT of the 30s, wouldn't she? Oh, the train of the 30s. The train. In many ways, the Comet could be an old suburban rail car lifted out of its normal environment and sent to do penance on a line through outback and pastoral New South Wales. Certainly, the celestial connotations of its name belong to the 1930s. At Orange, the 30s again defers to the 80s and a train which is meant to be taking Australia into the future of rail travel. It looks the part, but there are no tracks in Australia of a standard that will allow it to get to the designed cruising speed of 200 kilometres an hour. Consequently, the fastest the XPT can travel is around 160, and that's not much different to what the Comet was doing 40 to 50 years ago. A lot of places you, can, you cannot use the power, which you've got. What, what are the frustrations? I just know and you should think and you, sh you should be there a lot bigger than what you can... than what you are, you know. You, sh no, you, sh you should be travelling a lot quicker. You just can't use your power. There's been talk that a series of XPTs would eventually take over the main intercity services on East Coast Australia. So to some, the XPT has been seen as a high-tech ogre waiting to pounce. The opposite is probably true. Its use so far has been like flying Concorde between Melbourne and Brisbane, with stops at Albury, Canberra, Sydney and the Gold Coast on the way. Of course, there was probably just as much hype in 1937 about an air-conditioned wonder train they called the Comet. The Silver City Comet and the XPT may share the stretch of transcontinental railway line across New South Wales, but it belongs to the Indian Pacific. Now it's almost within smelling distance of Sydney, having passed through the lush hills and grazing areas immediately east of Perth, into the deserts and semi-deserts of South and Western Australia, through to the sparse farming and pastoral country of Western New South Wales.
With three days of travel behind, there's only the barrier of the Blue Mountains before Sydney. Past Lithgow, passengers get only a passing glimpse of some old carriages and the amazing viaducts which were a vital part of the rail breakthrough which tamed the mountain crossing. It's a fleeting moment in the long journey, a journey which couldn't have been made without the engineering brilliance which established the zigzag railway near Lithgow. In fact, along much the same route taken by explorers Blacksland, Lawson and Wentworth 50 years before. To the uninitiated, the zigzag can be a little confusing. Backwards, then forwards. Up the mountain, down the mountain. Turn around and repeat the process. At first, the logistics of the operation probably appear much the same as they would have nearly 120 years ago, with the train being pushed and pulled from the bottom to the top and back again. But these days, only one leg of the old zigzag is available to give tourists an idea of the hassles involved in getting a steam train through the mountains. The top of the zigzag is now a roadway, and the bottom is the main electrified line. That leaves only the middle section for the zigzag steam train. The zigzag was built in 1868 and 1869 by a bloke called John Whitten. He was sent out from England to build the line to the west, and when he got to Clarence, he ran into a bit of a problem. He had to drop down from the Clarence level on the top of the mountain to the Lithgow Valley floor, and it's 672 feet. Um, a train can't go down the same sort of grade as a car can, and the only way he could get down onto the valley floor was to build a giant zigzag. What it really is, is a giant Z carved in the side of the mountain. The engines used to come in from Clarence on the top of the Z. They then back down the middle of the Z and go forward again on the bottom of the Z into Lithgow, and that was more or less on the flat down at the bottom of the Z. It was built against tremendous odds. There were about there were two alternatives. One was a tunnel, which is, would have taken 10 million bricks, and the colony just did not have 10 million bricks. This was the other alternative, um, and they built the thing in absolute record time, and it opened without ceremony in 1869. Michael Forbes is the total steam devotee. As a fireman come driver on the railway, he appreciates not only the problems which were associated with the building of the line, but also the power of the old engines that conquered it. There's a really incredible feeling when you open the regulator of a steam locomotive for the first time. The power available to you is just about limitless. You have to be very careful how you control it, or the wheels will skid, or she'll stamp her feet as we call it but it's really a magnificent feeling of being in charge of a living, steam-powered monster. In engineering terms, the zigzag was regarded as one of the most significant achievements in the world during the 19th century. Even today, the track between Lithgow and Sydney includes the steepest mainline gradient in Australia, as much as 1 in 33. That compares with roughly 1 in 42 on much of the zigzag. But the combination of gradients, bad weather, single line and poor visibility around sharp curves meant that working trains on this line was often hazardous. The result was a series of accidents, usually related to trains running out of control down the slopes. Because of these problems, there were many proposals put forward to eliminate the zigzag. That finally happened with the building of a deviation track in 1910. Like many of the steam preservation groups on the rails around Australia, the zigzag is made up of bits and pieces collected from all over the country. Most of the carriages are from South Australia. The locos from Queensland and South Australia and the bogies were left over when Tasmania virtually eliminated its train services. These days, none of the components ever really get warmed up. By the time the zigzag gets its speed up, it's time to slow down and turn around again. 
so at the bottom of the ride, passengers become spectators, while the loco repositions for the trip back up the mountain. Frustrating as it may be, shunting backwards and forwards, up and down a mountain, the historic significance makes it worthwhile. The zigzag showed the way, and the electrified line from Lithgow down into Sydney is easy travelling indeed. Just the way to end a journey of nearly 4,000 kilometres over some of the most diverse terrain in the world. we come again and again. You get more people, more connections by this train than you would on a bus. I'd do it again uh, sometime. I wouldn't travel both ways. I'd uh, either fly down there or you know, go by car and come back by train and put the car on the train. know how anybody can get boring on this trip. Uh, there's plenty to see, there's plenty to do. You make friends and the uh, catering has been good. And everything about the whole trip's been good as far as I'm concerned. I just can't understand anybody getting boring. They just bring it on themselves, I think. inspired after seeing the five shows there's a vague plan of a marathon train journey floating around in the back of my head a very relaxing way to see our country wouldn't it meet lots of people and avoid the traffic jams maybe one day hope i'll see you again next week good night Next week on The World Around Us, an exciting new Malcolm Douglas adventure. Everyone is welcome at our house. A great new show on 7 Next, followed at 8.30 by the dramatic climax to A Town Like Alice. Brian Brown and Helen Morse in one of the truly great Australian miniseries, A Town Like Alice. Final chapter, 8.30 tonight. Oh, don't forget you can see the Sun City to Surf live on 7 tomorrow morning from 9am in Sports World.